Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, presentation today. I'm here with uh, Dr. Joy Kreiner. We're dealing with the topic of endobronchial valves placement in patients with um, emphysema who have refractory severe breathlessness. I think we can go to share the screen. So the title of the, this evening's symposium is endobronchial valve therapy, a uh, minimally invasive option for your patients with severe COPD. Uh, my name is Dennis O'Donnell. I'm a pulmonologist uh, from Canada, Ontario. My clinical and research interest is in COPD. And I'm sharing uh, the podium with uh, Dr. Jerry Kreiner, who's uh, well known to you all, a world authority on um, lung volume reduction, both surgical and endoscopic. And he's professor and founding chair of the Department of Thoracic Medicine and Surgery at Temple University. Here are my conflicts, none relevant to the current presentation. This is the plan for this evening's agenda. It's my task to talk about the lung hyperinflation as clinical importance and to really get into the physiology of why lung hyperinflation causes distressing shortness of breath and exercise intolerance in patients with COPD. Then we'll consider uh, new options in therapy, the endobronchial valves in particular. And Dr. Kreiner will, in, uh, will review the, the key clinical data from the multiple trials that are available. And the important last step is to identify patients that are eligible for this procedure. So let's start with the importance of hyperinflation and why it's a therapeutic target um, in patients with advanced emphysema and breathlessness. We'll define hyperinflation. We'll look briefly at the mechanisms uh, and measurement of hyperinflation, a word about prevalence, then we'll consider the impact um, of lung overinflation and dyspnea and exercise tolerance, and end with a case study that sets the stage for the next um, part of the talk. There's no universally acceptable definition of hyperinflation. It's generally agreed that um, it describes a situation when lung volumes exceeds the predicted relaxation volume of the respiratory system. Traditionally, uh, this has been defined as greater than 120% predicted total lung capacity. And that's called often thoracic hyperinflation. Then we go to static or resting lung hyperinflation defined by a functional residual capacity greater than 120. And um, yet another definition of pulmonary gas trapping or an increased residual volume of greater than 120% predicted. So um, in the near future, we will have uh, better normative population data on lung volumes across the whole spectrum of COPD and health. And I think we'll, for the first time, be able to define um, more precisely when lung volumes are greater than the upper limit of normal in patients with COPD. But for the moment, these are the traditional um, uh, definitions. The RV, of course, refers to the extent of pulmonary gas trapping and is determined by airway closure. Lung hyperinflation is determined largely by the uh, compliance characteristics of the lung and chest wall. And the total lung capacity, uh, higher total lung capacity refers to expansion or thoracic uh, hyperinflation, reconfiguration of the chest wall. We've known for a long time what the mechanisms of hyperinflation are. Consider this balloon and tube and car cartoon flow is determined by the recoil pressure of the lung, PL. Um, and it's also determined by the resistance of the upstream segment. Resistance is also critically dependent on alveolar attachments or these springs which uh, tether or expand the airways. So um, in healthy individuals, the flow generated is really a function of the driving pressure for flow, which is the elastic recoil of the lung. 
In emphysema, we get a different pattern. First of all, the recall pressure is diminished and with it, the driving pressure for flow. Second, we have destruction of the alveolar attachments, which render the airways more liable to collapse on exhalation. And this is coupled with narrowing of the airways due to mucosal uh, inflammation and mucus plugging, etc., which further increase resistance, such that the flow generated during an expiratory maneuver is markedly diminished compared to health. So these are the features that result in expiratory flow limitation and air trapping. In other words, even after a full exhalation, there's still some residual air which is not emptied. And this is compounded by the prevailing breathing pattern. If the time left for breathing out isn't sufficient, then there isn't enough room to empty the lungs between each breath and you get this phenomenon of air trapping. So um, lung hyperinflation in emphysema is related to two distinct pathways. One is the reduced recoil, and the other is this phenomenon of um, time dependence on expiratory flow, which is often abnormal in patients with COPD. Now, we can actually measure lung volumes very accurately. The gold standard is the body box or body plethysmography. We get indirect information about um, the amount of air left in the lungs at the end or at the beginning of an inspiration. It's called the inspiratory capacity. That means the maximal amount of air that can be breathed in after a quiet breath out. And as you'll see, I emphasize this a bit because it's very important in understanding um, the nature and the severity of breathlessness in emphysema. There are other uh, techniques, of course, for measuring hyperinflation, which are generally not used commonly, at least in, in, the, clinically, in the clinical domain. Uh, let's look at um, volume components. End expiratory lung volume refers to the amount of air left in the lungs at the end of a quiet breath out. It's the equivalent to FRC, and I use the words interchangeably here. The yellow is the inspiratory reserve volume the difference between end expiratory lung volume and TLC. And blue is the operating tidal volume. So that if we look at tidal breathing in, out, in, out, and then we ask the patient after the, end, after the next breath out, take a deep breath all the way in and relax, you reach the inspiratory capacity, you reach TLC, and this is the inspiratory capacity. Uh, if you look at someone with emphysema, it's a different story altogether because of the increased air trapping and, and hyperinflation. We see that this inspiratory reserve volume is disappearing, basically. If you look at tidal breathing again and ask to take, uh, them to take a deep breath all the way into TLC, look at how diminished it is. So the, the bottom line is inspiratory capacity is diminished. And I bet you if you ask your patient when they feel short of breath after walking down the corridor or climbing the stairs, what does it feel like? They'll tell you, I can't get enough air in. They're actually telling you about their reduced uh, inspiratory capacity. Uh, some people get confused about the, the fact that these individuals have huge amounts of air within the lungs. For example, this patient has a TLC of greater than nine liters compared to the healthy individual which is about three liters. Uh, but in spite of this, uh, the inspiratory capacity is only a liter. It should be more than three liters. So the accessible volume during breathing is the inspiratory capacity. And we should never forget that this is the important measurement uh, in terms of understanding what's going on with these patients. Now, we've, there's no real history or, or studies on the natural history of lung hyperinflation. We have abundance of information from cross-sectional studies, and this is one of them from our own lab, looking at FRC or end expiratory lung volume uh, from goal one to goal four compared with health. And we see this progressive hyperinflation, even surprisingly so in patients with uh, goal one. So it starts fairly early in the disease and progresses relentlessly until advanced disease and with it, we get the progressive decline in inspiratory capacity. Uh, so from when Fletcher was looking at the natural history uh, of airway obstruction by FEV1, 
he didn't look at the associated volumes. It's a great pity because that would have given us very important information about the patho pathology or pathophysiology of COPD. This has been well studied. Why is hyperinflation uh, bad? It's certainly in, uh, clearly linked to an increased risk of mortality. Uh, there's a few papers showing it's linked with the, it's predictive of uh, the number of exacerbations. It's certainly uh, clearly correlated with quality of life. It has profound cardiocirculatory effects that we're only beginning to understand now. And it's very clearly related to dyspnea and exercise intolerance. We'll just deal with two of these things today. This is a famous study by Casanova, which looked at survival in COPD and looked at an index of hyperinflation, the inspired capacity TLC ratio. And if this is small and you look at all cause mortality and respiratory, the, the higher the amount of hyperinflation, the lower the inspiratory capacity, the worse the prognosis for all cause and respiratory mortality. So this was an independent predictor, and that is independent of FEV1. Why is hyperinflation linked to dyspnea? I'm sure your patients with more advanced disease will be stopping their climbing of the stairs at the fourth step or so, having to recover before they can continue the journey. And this is related uh, to hyperinflation, as we'll see, at least in part. So these are the same lung volumes I mentioned earlier, but now it's uh, documented throughout exercise as ventilation increases in health and in COPD. We can see this nice progression and expansion of tidal volume. And when they reach the peak ventilation of 74 liters per minute, they still have reserve and they have a nice wedge-shaped increase in VT. Contrast that now with the emphysematous patients, the inspiratory capacity is already diminished, so and with it the inspiratory reserve volume, and is compounded further by this uh, further increase in hyperinflation or reduction in inspiratory capacity as ventilation increases. The breathing frequency increases, there's not enough time to empty, so we get this phenomenon of dynamic hyperinflation. But the consequence is this, the markedly diminished, critically low inspired reserve volume. They have to stop, there's no room to breathe, they're extremely uncomfortable, and their peak ventilation is only 34 liters per minute. So this is the whole story. If we were able to reduce the FRC and the residual volume, or they'll go down together, of course, we will uh, expand the ability to um, in increase VT expansion um, by increasing the inspiratory reserve volume. Now, without going into any great detail on the neurophysiology of dyspnea, I'll simply tell you that when your patient with emphysema is breathless, one of the main things that is going on is that the drive to breathe from the brainstem and cortical centers in the brain um, is markedly increased. And the drive is increased um, in part or mainly uh, in people with emphysema because of the uh, constraints that the hyperinflation brings to the respiratory muscles. It's a huge disadvantage for the muscles of breathing. And we get this disparity or mismatch or dissociation between the neural drive to breathe and the ability of the respiratory system to respond because of the effects of hyperinflation. Again, if we were lucky enough to deflate these lungs, we would restore a better balance between the high drive to breathe and the ability to expand tidal volume. So I'll just show you one example of what I mean um, to, so that you understand how we measure drive and how increased it is in COPD. We use these um, multi-pair electrodes. They're anchored by two catheters, one in the esophagus and one in the stomach, so we can measure transdiaphragmatic pressures. Um, so we're measuring the pulse electrical activation coming down the phrenix to the diaphragm with each breath. And we can measure all of these. We can measure the drive, which is diaphragm EMG, and we can measure the mechanical response of the system uh, by looking at intrathoracic pressures. If we compare an emphysematous individual, same age, 68 years of age, at a low exercise tolerance, or 
our standardized work rate of 60 watts. And we measure these different parameters. I think you'll appreciate that in the COPD uh, individual with emphysema, with each breath in, and yellow is the inspiratory cycle, there's much more electrical activation uh, of the phrenic. Uh, and that's telling you how high the drive is. If you look at the flows here, this is inspiratory flow, expiratory, inspiratory. Uh, the flows are quite similar, but to generate the same flows, look what the emphysema this patient has to do. It needs, they, they need a much higher drive to breathe and much greater work of breathing or interthoracic pressure excursions. So that's the fundamental problem. Um, and the main reason is the effects of lung hyperinflation. So if you look at the drive to breathe measured by EMG over work rate in different groups of patients, this is a composite slide from a, a number of studies in the lab, blue is healthy. And as you get more and more severe, this becomes more vertical. Um, so you can see these people here with emphysema, their drive is increased markedly at nearly 70% of the maximal at the low work rate of only 40 watts. Compare this to health or the other stages of COPD. So this is our big challenge. How on earth can we reduce this drive so as um, to reduce the degree of respiratory discomfort? Now, again, there's very precise documentation in multiple studies of the physiology of hyperinflation. And I'll just summarize them very briefly. Hyperinflation uh, results in, in much greater increased muscle effort and work of breathing to achieve a given ventilation. As we've seen before, the mechanical constraints uh, of hyperinflation are such as they constrain the ability of tidal volume to expand. It becomes monotonous and fixed, and uh, that this introduces the neuromechanical dissociation. And because the muscles, particularly the diaphragm, are at such a, a disadvantage, much greater electrical activation or drive is required to achieve the same force generation. And this translates into more dyspnea and reduced exercise tolerance. So that's the story, um, our understanding of hyperinflation and how deleterious effects it has on um, clinical physiology and symptoms in patients with COPD. So let's look at a patient of mine. He very graciously and he actually encouraged me to use his photo here. This is Bill. Um, He's 66 years of age, 34 pack year smoking history. Uh, he has advanced COPD. I'll show you the data in a second. His MRC dyspnea, that's the classical, that's not the modified, it's four out of five, basically. He suffers two to three flare ups a year. He's on triple therapy. He's using his albuterol uh, 12 puffs a day at least. And he's really getting increasingly frustrated, uh, very anxious and prone to these respiratory panic attacks, which are like uh, waterboarding. That's a terrible, terrible experience. I followed him up over these um, seven years. And these are this is his FRC, and yellow is the inspiratory capacity. And this is his FEV1. And as I'm sure as you've all noted, as you get to more advanced disease, this plateaus. It reaches its nadir and stays there. So it's 27% predicted over those years didn't change. But what we did measure is the effect on hyperinflation. In, in, those, in that time, his FRC and residual volume increased by uh, almost two liters. So this is one of the reasons why, um, why Bill is so breathless. And again, if only we were able to reduce this residual volume and recruit an inspiratory capacity, we know that we can achieve these beneficial effects. So um, I did my best to optimize his therapy. I didn't get any change in his FEV1, 27% predicted. Uh, we did, um, despite no change in flows, we got a nice change in inspiratory capacity by uh, 0.35 liters. In these people with very advanced disease, even these small changes are a big deal and is probably responsible for his improved symptoms and delay in getting and having to stop his exercise because of breathlessness. He has a fixed diffusion capacity, which is really a problem. 
and this points to the vascular destruction of emphysema. Uh, his residual volume was over six liters, normal two li three liters, sorry, 215% predicted. Uh, amazingly, he didn't desaturate significantly after 200 meters on a six minute walk distance. And uh, we had to beg um, and write a mode of letters to get um, home or, or ambulatory oxygen for him to help during his exercise training in pulmonary rehab. But we eventually achieved it and it did help him. The CT showed extensive homogeneous emphysema. He wasn't a candidate for lung volume reduction surgery. Um, and he declined after discussions, he did, declined the opportunity for, um, for lung transplantation. He wasn't keen on this idea at all. So despite all my efforts and a 12-week pulmonary rehab program, uh, his MRC is still four, not quite housebound, but extremely breathless um, with minor activity, minimal activity. So the aim then is to try and deflate these very inflated lungs. We can do it with combined bronchodilators. We'll get three to four, 0.3 to 0.4 um, liters improvement in as I see in spiratory capacity. Even exercise training, if it's if they reach physiological training effects, breathing frequency comes goes down. They breathe more efficiently and deflate their lungs better with each breath. So it reduces the rate of dynamic hyperinflation or air trapping. And this is what we're considering today, these uh, relatively new um, interventions. Um, we don't, in Canada, we don't have uh, recourse to, to the, it's not um, approved by the Ministry of Health. But I'd love to know if, if this patient is a candidate for endoscopic um, interventions with valves. Uh, oxygen actually also reduces the rate of hyperinflation. So we know that if we successfully deflate these patients and reduce their residual volume, we'll improve the respiratory muscle function. We'll reduce the inspiratory neural drive, which is the main reason for breathlessness. We'll improve cardiocirculatory function, which has been shown in a number of studies. We even improve pulmonary gas exchange by decompressing a regional hyperinflation and opening up vessels that were previously compressed. Um, and we will delay the onset of severe dyspnea and improve exercise tolerance. And also, it, this will be a useful adjunct to further exercise training. So um, the last slide then, if we had a, a successful um, volume reducing effect, um, intervention, we will recruit an increased inspiratory capacity. And this means that the inspiratory reserve volume will increase. Tidal volume will expand more. They'll go on to higher ventilations than pre, uh, before they have to stop uh, at a critical low IRV because of intolerable breathlessness. So that's the general aim. So the key messages are lung hyperinflation is very common particularly in advanced disease and in those with structural emphysema. It's a clearly an independent predictor of mortality and a number of important clinical outcomes. We're, um, learned, we've learned a lot about the link between hyperinflation, dyspnea and exercise tolerance. And we understand that um, if we manage to deflate these lungs, we'll improve these outcomes. And that even partial reduction of severe lung hyperinflation yields short-term and likely long-term clinical benefits. So it's a very important therapeutic target in these patients with emphysema. Um, and some, we should always be um, aware of that. So this is Bill, believe it or not. Um, he he is a, was a volunteer with the Lung Association. And this is his, uh, grand, his granddaughter. And he noticed this caption, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And I remember the day he came into my office and said, you know, there's nothing more true than this. Good. Thank you very much indeed. So after Dr. O'Donnell provided the background of the importance and implications of hyperinflation, I'm going to move in to talk about uh, the data that um, exists with bronchoscopic lung reduction. 
Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, these are a combination of um, grant funding and consultant funding. And the most important is that uh, some of these studies were sponsored by Pulmonic's Liberate trial, as well as some of the consulting regarding the Zephyr valve. So this part of the agenda, I'm gonna really talk about in the bronchial valves as a um, new option. So here's our spectrum of uh, treatment options that we have for patients. For the less invasive maneuvers, we have the medical therapy as Dennis just uh, re uh, reviewed for us, oxygen therapy, steroids, bronchodilators, pulmonary rehabilitation, vaccinations and weight control. But in some patients that are non-responsive to that therapy, especially patients with COPD that have a predominant emphysematous phenotype, an irreversible airflow obstruction with a propensity for disease progression, lung volume reduction surgery or lung transplantation may be viable options for those candidates. So some patients, however, like Bill, don't want those maneuvers or can't have them based on the um, the uh, anatomic uh, uh, description or uh, presentation or disease. So perhaps for these patients, another option exists, and that's patients that are getting uh, endobronchial valve treatment with the Zephyr valve. And the reason why this has been declared as breakthrough technology approved by the FDA is for patients with severe emphysema, these devices, which are small, can give benefits similar to surgery with no cutting, uh, patient phenotypic description, both physiologically and structurally by imaging, has been shown over the last 15 years to select the patients most likely to benefit um, and how they benefit in terms of the treatment options that they provide with when placing the valve. And there's been five prospective randomized control trials using the Zephyr valve that have shown patient outcomes. And we'll describe those a little bit later. This has resulted in them to be adopted by guidelines in an international standpoint. And in patients that have need for adjustment or patients that don't benefit or have complications locally related to the therapy, which are rare but can occur, these valves are also removable. So this is where the spectrum of treatment is with the, the Zephyr and the bronchial valve. It's really in these patients who have been optimized on less invasive medical treatments, but not candidates or not desiring a more invasive treatments that we can tackle hyperinflation for these distinct uh, patient population with the use of this technology. Therapy. So this is the Zephyr valve and how it the works. The Zephyr valve procedure is performed under general anesthesia or conscious sedation where a standard bronchoscope and flexible delivery catheter are used to guide the valves into the target lobe and desired airway. Multiple valves are implanted to ensure complete occlusion of all airways leading to the target lobe of the lung. Valves may be placed at the lobar, segmental, or subsegmental levels dependent on the airway anatomy. Trapped air in the treated lobe escapes through the Zephyr valves until the lung volume of the treated lobe is reduced. The valves can be removed and replaced if needed. After treatment, the remaining lobes can expand more fully and pressure on the diaphragm is relieved, improving breathing mechanics and overall lung function. So that gives you a brief overview of what's trying to be accomplished uh, with the procedure. But this diagram shows how the mechanism of treatment uh, successful low bar occlusion, reducing air trapping, as Dennis just provided to us, can improve lung function and translate into improved clinical performance by less breathlessness by the patient, improved quality of life, and improvement of other performances of health status that are measured by pulmonary and non-pulmonary composite indices. So the benefits are tied to the mechanism. So um, how do patients feel about this? Well, this is a study that was published in a journal of COPD Foundation that queried patients with emphysema who had significant air trapping and asked them, would they want to choose a therapy such as this that although less invasive than surgery still carries risk and with their risk identified to them, such as pneumothorax, increased risk of exacerbation, risk of pneumonia or risk of respiratory failure. And as you can see, that about three quarters of these patients chose an endobronchial valve over current treatment. And the reason is this is because dyspnea, breathlessness, is the most troublesome symptom that these patients have. 
and they're least likely to find benefit with the current treatments that exist. So patients overall uh, really view breathlessness or dyspnea as the major obstacle to improvement of their quality of life. So let's go over some of the key clinical data from the multiple trials that I mentioned before that have been conducted. Well, this is kind of the snapshot of the learning curve over the last 20 years of lung reduction. However, there's another curve I could show that predates this from 1957 on when Otto Brannigan at the University of Maryland first adopted the use of a lung volume reduction surgical procedure at that time, showed benefit, but the morbidity and the mortality was excessive at that time with those surgical techniques that existed. In 1992, Joel Cooper, father of lung transplantation, revised and reformed and improved this procedure and provided data on 20 patients that received a bilateral lung volume reduction surgery with significant improvements in clinical outcomes with acceptable morbidity and no mortality. And that really was the genesis of looking at this therapy more um, uh, exhaustively, and that was done by the NET trial after a couple single center trials that showed benefit, but also in some data sets also showed harm. So the National Emphysema Treatment Trial, or NET, was a prospective randomized multi-center controlled study done at 17 centers, looking at optimized medical therapy versus that, plus bilateral lung volume reduction surgery, either through median sternotomy or uh, bilateral sequential VATs in 1,218 patients. And that showed an improvement in the primary outcome, which was exercise tolerance um, and improvement in quality of life and, uh, and lung function. In a subgroup of patients that are upper load predominant, low exercise post rehab, which meant they were ventilatory limited, there was a signal for a significant improvement in survival. So in the late um, uh, 90s, 1998, there was a quest to try to duplicate the findings with surgery, but do it from an endoscopic standpoint. And a Zephyr valve developed in the late 90s and started with the vent trial in about 2004, was a prospective randomized multi-center control trial in 350 patients trying to look at the Zephyr valve placed in one lobe, not bilateral, but one lobe with total low bar occlusion to see if we could mimic these benefits. And although that showed Benefits in about a third of the patient population, there were lessons learned that suggested why this wasn't beneficial in all, such as fissure integrity, the degree of heterogeneity, as well as whether total low bar occlusion was maintained. Building on that, the Believer study also showed similar data suggesting that fissure integrity was important, but that upper or lower lobe treatment could show improvement in patient's outcome. A single center study done in, the, uh, by, uh, in Groningen uh, by Dirk John Slebos and Karen Kluster found that patients that were physiologically characterized with the use of the Chartist device to show um, no evidence of collateral ventilation, these patients had a durable and significant improvement in outcome. And then multi-center trial looking at this in patients with homogeneous disease, and then multi-center trials looking at patients with heterogeneous disease, again, showed that upper versus lower lobe treatment, patients that were CV negative by Chartis who had heterogeneous disease had significant improvements in patient outcome. And I'll provide you this data overall. The Liberate trial was the one that was used for the FDA for the PMA for FDA approval, because this was the longest follow-up of patients overall after the treatment. This was 12 months for a primary endpoint. So what does this data in aggregate shows that the clinical benefits fit a diverse patient profile. Patients could be treated in upper versus lower lobes. Remember from lung volume reduction surgery that mainly favored patients that were treated in upper lobes with surgical treatment, but with unilober, not bilateral, but unilober treatment, upper or lower, these uh, magnitude of the benefits mimic those found with bilateral upper lobe predominant surgical uh, conduct, uh, uh, treatment. And heterogeneous versus homogeneous patients showed benefits with the use of low bar treatment. And then collateral ventilation status could be used by a structural surrogate with fissure integrity found by HRCT or identified by HRCT and can be confirmed or shown physiologically by using measurements of collateral ventilation with the Chartist system. 
So these are the lessons from the VENT trial and the BELIEVER trial. The lessons are similar in a sense that if patients were collateral ventilation negative, they had significant improvement in FEV1. If patients were uh, not uh, tr treated with this effort valve or a mixture of patients with collateral ventilation, positive and negative, there was a muted clinical benefit that was seen. So patients without collateral ventilation have greater improvement and total low bar occlusion, uh, not partial uh, low bar occlusion is key for patients improvement. So this is for those who may not be familiar, a cartoon that shows what collateral ventilation screening is. This is taking the left lung across the left major fissure. This is, would be an example of no collateral ventilation. There's no flow, save we're treating the upper lobe. There's no air coming through the lower lobe and keeping the upper lobe inflated. This would be a patient that basically has a non-intact fissure or collateral ventilation positive by uh, physiologic status you would not treat this patient with an endobronchial valve or the Zephyr valve, whereas a patient with no collateral ventilation may be an appropriate target. This is uh, kind of the tools that have been enabled to try to select your patients. First, this is a quantitative CT report of the, the degree of emphysematous impairment. Uh, it's color-coded that the more emphysematous uh, extent by voxel density at 9, 10 Hansfeld units, which was used in all Zephyr studies, is darker. Um, so this is most emphysema in a right upper lobe followed by a uh, second degree of emphysema in a left upper lobe. So 74% in a right upper lobe, there's 69% in a left upper lobe. And again, also color coding for fissure intactness. If the fissure is more intact, more than 95%, then you can see the darkness of the line and you can see the right uh, major fissure is 100% intact and the left major fissure is 98% intact. So by using this kind of like schematic of the um, data from the quantitative CT scan for, uh, uh, for Hansfeld unit in Denzel, Denzel, uh, voxel density, you can see the right upper lobe has more severe emphysema, the left upper lobe has second degree. So it gives you two targets, maybe the right upper lobe and the right middle lobe together would be your target in this case, there's 50% emphysema here and a combined volume of 2.2 liters of treating the right upper lobe and right middle lobe. And the secondary target may be the left upper lobe where the liter uh, volume uh, change is 2.2 liters, which is almost identical to what you would receive in this patient with the right upper and right middle lobe. So you can make a primary target and a secondary target as you map your case uh, using the Chartist system intra-procedurally to help to confirm fissure integrity. Um, so this is really a combination of quantitative analysis of CT scan and identify one or more procedural targets in, when you plan it. And then at the time of the procedure, using the Chartist assessment for collateral ventilation to help to confirm, in this case, whatever lobe they chose, this was a CV negative. So you can uh, have more precision in planning. The pulmonics Chartist system provides precise pulmonary flow and pressure readings allowing physicians to assess the patient's collateral ventilation. By identifying diseased lobes with no collateral airflow, physicians can optimize the valve placement for endoscopic lung volume reduction. So this is just a cartoon of a patient on positive pressure ventilation at the top that shows decelerating flow, no collaterals, good uh, place to treat is the patient with no uh, significant diminution of flow on positive pressure ventilation. So you would not treat this patient. High likelihood of having uh, no treatment effect because of collateral ventilation. And when you use this kind of technology, this is what you can expect to see. This was the Stelvio trial, the uh, data, uh, data by Kluster and Slebos and Groningen. There was 84 patients that had a mixture of heterogeneous or homogeneous disease uh, who had likely complete fissures by CT, but then about 20 uh, of these patients did not have an intact uh, uh, fissure by measurement physiologically of collateral flow with the Chartist. These patients that were then randomized, 68 into the trial to receive either uh, EBV treatment with the Zephyr valve or to function as a control group. After these patients were followed for a period of six months, you can see that the EBV group had about three quarters of the patient had minimal important clinical differences. You can see this is the MCID in a green bar here. Improvements in FEV1, six-minute walk distance, and significant improvement in SGRQ. 
um, you know that uh, a decrease in SGRQ by four points is the MCID, but this was uh, more than double that in most patients that were treated in this trial. And this compares with the control group with optimal medical therapy that there were patients, 24%, that met the MCID of uh, improvements in FEV1 or six-minute walk or SGRQ, but the magnitude of the improvement by a patient histogram is more robust that more patients had that treatment of greater magnitude after treatment. To show that this is like a reproducible phenomenon, when the control group crossed over to be treated with the Zephyr valve, you can see that they duplicated, they mirrored the patients who were randomized to the treatment group pretty well after the patients crossed over. So this was seen in patients with heterogeneous disease, but some of the patients also had homogeneous disease. So that's one skilled center with one skilled proceduralist. How about can other people do this? And this was the TRANSFORM study that was a follow-up to the Stelvio study. This is a European multicenter trial in 97 patients with heterogeneous disease with the ipsilateral lobe chosen for treatment had 10% emphysema compared to the ipsilateral non-treated lobe at least. And what you can see in this um, study that patients had also about a 100 ml improvement in FEV1 out to the primary endpoint at six months. This is the treated group shown in the stippled line compared to the optimized uh, medical treatment shown in the dashed line. And this is the inner group difference shown here in the gold. And you can see that at three months and at six months, patients met the MCID, about 100 ml improvement in FEV1 compared to a slight decrease in the patients with the control arm. You can see the SGRQ associated improvements was double the MCID at about eight points overall, both the treated and the intergroup difference. And you can see that the six minute walk distance in the patients treated with the Zephyr valve also was about uh, almost 40 meters uh, overall, and it remained stable. While the patients in the transform group that did not continue to receive rehabilitation and did not have the Zephyr valve placement showed some decline over time. The important thing is these uh, physiologic and functional measures and uh, pros patient reported outcomes were married to a mechanism, which is approximately a 600 uh, ml decrease in residual volume measured by body plethysmography following the treatment compared to no substantial change in a patients with controlled therapy. And if one looks at an aggregate measure of the composite of pulmonary and non-pulmonary factors, you see a decrease in the BOD. And we know from the medical arm and net that a BOD index of one is significant and is associated, at least in the net trial patients with emphysema in the medical arm, about 11% mortality in one year, if that's appropriately powered and looked for that. So that's what the TRANSFORM study showed that other people could do this. How about Liberate? Liberate was a larger study than Transform. It was about uh, two times larger, and it was patients followed out to one year. These were patients, uh, 35 centers, mainly in the U.S., but out also outside the U.S. of severe heterogeneous emphysema, also randomized uh, after they had all received a Chartist procedure, so no evidence of collateral ventilation, two to one to Zephyr valve to standard of care. Um, and in this patient group, this, the demographics are to show that these patients were ill. Um, and you can see that because uh, they had about 70% uh, emphysema in a targeted lobe. Their post bronchodilator FEV1 was about three quarters of a liter, or about 26%, 28% of predicted. Diffusion capacity was about 34%. They were significantly air trapped, residual volumes about 225% of predicted. Six minute walk was 300 meters, and this is after they already conducted pulmonary rehabilitation. Their SGRQ was in the mid 50s, high, shows that they were significantly symptomatic, and their MMRC was about two and a half overall. Their BOAT index was about five, and about a third of this patient population was on continuous oxygen therapy because of their symptoms. And you can see here that they're also of um, uh, mid 60s, they're coming into the study. So this is a regular index of sick patient group with emphysema that's significant with irreversible airflow obstruction. <clears throat> so let's look at the outcomes. The primary endpoint of this study with the FDA was looking at a responder analysis. That is the proportion of patients that had an FEV1 change from baseline to 12 months of greater than or equal to 15%. 
And this was a background of patients already on optimized medical therapy, bronchodilators, rehabilitation, use of oxygen therapy. And what you can see in the patient population who received the Zephyr valve, approximately 50% or 47.7 to be exact, had a greater than or equal to 15% of uh, change of FEV1 compared to their baseline at one year post-treatment compared to 16.8% of the control population. And you can see similar to the transform study at one year, the improvement in FEV1 was at 100 mLs, again, tied to the mechanism that the residual volume decreased by about uh, 600 to 500 mLs at the end of the one year period of time. Again, important secondary out outcomes, the patient's breathlessness was markedly reduced. The, F uh, the MMRC was, um, as a measure of breathlessness, was decreased by about 0.6. The SGRQ improved again more than, well, double at one year. And a six minute walk distance was improved, not so much as what we see in the transform study, which is similar to most US studies compared to populations outside the US who are more ambulatory, but it was improved in a treatment group with the Zephyr valve and maintained stability compared to the control population where continued to decline. And again, the BOD index was reduced, not so much as what we found in the TRANSFORM study, but significantly reduced compared to the, um, the control population where the BOD index continued to rise. One of the things I think it's important, this is in a supplement in a blue journal paper uh, of the LIBERATE uh, study, is that if you look at the magnitude of their improvements for physiologic, uh, patient reported outcomes and other important measures of breathlessness and BOD. Uh, more than half of the group after Zephyr valve treatment, these patients had these at 12 months. And again, tied to the mechanism that 84% of the patients that were treated in a Liberate trial met the MCID for targeted low volume reduction with a measure of quantitated CT volume at the end of one year compared to what it was at their baseline with a greater than 350 ml. Uh, reduction. So the mechanism is tied with the clinical benefit. These are some other derivative uh, studies with the activity uh, responders that we found. You can see the percentage of the patients that had greater than uh, 25 meters improvement in uh, meters walk during six minute walk. Um, improvement in transitional dyspnea index being less. The magnitude of effort being less functional impairment in SGRQ, the numbers of patients or the percentage of the population all overall was greater than 50% compared um, to the uh, standard of care where patients had improvements, but a magnitude was about one third of what we saw with treatment. One of the things that's important to realize is the durability of these treatment response in reducing dyspnea, which 80% of patients report is the most troublesome symptom that they have and less likely to be treated with current therapies, at least in an emphysema patient population. And using this emphysema symptom intensity over 12 months index, which is described here, you can see that the patient's daily score after use of endobronchial valves with the Zephyr valve for bronchoscopic lung reduction was much more robust, uh, was basically less than half of what it was in patients that were on optimal medical treatment. So it has showed a durable daily treatment improvement in patients' breathlessness, which is something that's a chronic symptom that plagues them throughout their life. How about safety? Um, well, this looks at SAEs, and because the Liberate trial was longer, it was purposely designed to look at the periprocedural period and look at complications compared to standard of care. This was not sham bronchoscopy in the study, so these are patients continue with medical treatment. And we know that bronchoscopy itself in a patient population like I've described carries risk besides the risk of the bronchoscopy plus the valve implantation. And then we separated that from a longer period of time, which was from day 45 to the end of the study for the first year of 365 days. And what you can see is that statistically significant increase in pneumothorax that was seen in patients after Zephyr valve treatment. And this is to be expected based on the other studies that when you pick patients with low bar uh, who, or you plan to provide low bar occlusion, total low bar occlusion in a valve that is, has either a complete fissure or a CV negative status, <clears throat> that when this 
lobe collapses, you can't control that. And there is ipsilateral non-targeted lobe expansion that can be rapid at times. And if it's too rapid and exceeds the volume and flow rate of that ipsilateral non-treated lobe, you can get a, a pneumothorax that can be uh, can develop. This was the statistically significant complications that we saw. Um, exacerbations were more common compared to patients that did not have bronchoscopy optimal care, but it didn't reach the statistical significant level as did pneumonia and respiratory failure. Mortality, I'm going to talk about this a, a little bit in a minute on the subsequent slide, but you can see, although it didn't reach statistically significance, the mortality was found in the first 45 days in a Zephyr valve treated group compared to standard of care. And I'm gonna tell you why that was more likely to occur in a subsequent slide. When we look at the longer term period though, day 45 and greater, we see the mortality is actually the same numerically, but the pre prevalence of that is a little bit less because there's double the number of patients in the in a Zephyr valve treated arm. Exacerbation, uh, severe exacerbations trended to be less, but was not statistically significant. It was like 0 0.05. And these are events that were uh, adjudicated not by the investigators, by a separate adjudication committee. You see that pneumonia is, is less, but not statistically significant, but uh, respiratory failure is less and it is statistically significant overall. And this mirrors the reduction in exacerbation and respiratory failure that was seen in a net trial. Much larger study where we found that patients that were followed at one year or greater, that the exacerbation rate with lung volume reduction surgery was about 29% less in patients that were treated with surgery because these patients were less gas trapped and hyperinflated, contributing to dyspnea and embarrassment of mechanics. So let's talk about uh, why. Uh, death happened in Liberate. Well, when we first designed the trial, patients were able to go home uh, the day after. And the problem with that is, is that patients are at risk for pneumothorax at most for the first three days after the procedure. 76% of the pneumothoraces happened at that time. And the first two deaths that occurred in Liberate in the treated arm occurred in patients the next day who died of a pneumothorax at home after we did autopsies. We halted the trial. <clears throat> we basically went back and looked at commercial data in Europe that existed in that time. And then we basically went back to the FDA with our um, D DMSB uh, and we revised the trial. So patients remained in the hospital in Liberate for the first five days post the procedure until we knew exactly when the rate of pneumothorax occurred. Once that happened, the, the risk of death uh, was only uh, approximately one patient who developed a pneumothorax and respiratory failure from prolonged ventilator support. And um, the, um, the death rate, as you saw, it was much less after that period of time. But the reason is because pneumothorax happens in the first three days post-procedure. That's why we request that patients be hospitalized for at least three days post-procedure to be able to be in a setting where pneumothorax can be identified and appropriately treated. So though pneumothorax is a complication of this procedure, it's a procedure that can be identified and it can be treated satisfactorily with patient outcomes that are identical to patients that don't have uh, a pneumothorax. So here's a summary of the key measures across the studies in uh, CV negative patients that are done by the Liberate study and TRANSFORM, which I've reviewed with you, the IMPACT study, which I'm gonna tell you in a minute, and a Stelvio trial that I did show, improvements in lung function that are about 18 to 29%, Improvement in exercise capacity, you can see the range of about 28 meters seen in impact homogeneous patients to 79 meters in patients in a transform study. And then a, a really consistent improvement in at least double the MCID in these studies in patients that uh, are, are done and anywhere from one year out to three to six months um, in the other studies. So, how about the impact study? The impact study is important because this is the only prospective randomized controlled trial done in a homogeneous patient population with emphysema. This was done in Europe and was led by Arshan Valapur from Vienna. This was 93 patients with homogeneous emphysema that were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to Zephyrvale plus optimal medical treatment versus optimal medical treatment by itself. And this is the primary endpoint that the intergroup difference was about a 17% improvement in FEV1 uh, 
compared to baseline favoring the Zephyr valve, the absolute improvement in the Zephyr valve treated group was 13.7% of the patients. But if you look here, it's shown uh, graphically, you can see about 100 ml improvement in FEV1 shown at six months. The primary endpoint for the study was three months, which was 100 ml, but you can see durability of treatment effect when patients followed out to six months. Again, a slight decrease in the patients with optimal medical treatment. The MMRC, again, was decreased by about 0.4. The SGRQ was improved to the magnitude of about what we see with heterogeneous disease. And that's not only in this study, but if you look at any treatment, surgical treatment or other forms of treatment in patients with homogeneous disease, the major treatment benefit that these patients have, and it's durable, is an improvement in quality of life because of an improvement in dyspnea. And you can see, again, tied to the mechanism with this study, a decrease in residual volume, again, about 500 ml, similar to the heterogeneous patient population. And that also has an improvement in a six-minute walk distance that's durable over that period of time, more than patients with optimized medical treatment. So the results of these studies have resulted in um, the um, clinical acceptance of Zephyr valve or bronchoscopic lung reduction with the Zephyr valve being recommended as treatment in selected patients who meet the criteria, which I'll show you at the end. Um, given level A evidence for gold uh, for management of patients with emphysema, the NICE also give it a similar um, uh, recommendations for care. The Australian Lung Foundation, the German Respiratory Society, and National Healthcare Institute of the Netherlands. And this has resulted in globally more than 20,000 patients being treated with the Zephyr valve for bronchoscopic lung reduction worldwide at this time. So I'm just gonna mo move into now, which patients are eligible for treatment? <clears throat> well, this indication for Zephyr valves, and there's four valves, there's uh, a four millimeter, there's a 5.5 millimeter for different widths, widths and different lengths, a lower profile and, uh, and a regular profile for patients that are a little bit longer with a regular profile. It's indicated for patients for bronchoscopic treatment of adults with significant hyperinflation associated with severe emphysema and regions of the lung <clears throat> that have little to no collateral ventilation. Um, and this is the minimum criteria, confirmed diagnosis of COPD, and it's due to emphysema structurally once you get an HRCT. Patients that are non-smoking or have a willing to commit smoke, uh, to quit smoking and are smoking abstinent for at least four months before you contemplate the intervention. Patients with an FEV1 less than 50% are predicted. In most cases, it's 15% to 45% are predicted. And patients that are breathless despite optimal medical management and MRC here too and greater as outlined here. And the optimized medical management is what Dennis had provided for us in the previous talk. How to send a referral? Well, there's a couple uh, ways. You can identify uh, potential patients by using an EHR for patients that are breathless overall and have appropriate diagnostic codes who are on optimized medical treatment and are still um, uh, breathless. You can make a connection with a local treatment center and, and reach out to them to discuss referrals and set up a referral process. And once a patient is referred for treatment, you should send them to an institution that can treat them not only for bronchoscopic lung reduction, but can offer the patient other treatment options. You remember in the case that Dennis presented for Bill, Bill had other options discussed with him. Um, unfortunately, Zephyr valve treatment wasn't an option for that patient, but he was discussed for lung volume reduction surgery or lung transplantation besides optimal medical treatment. And this is the typical workup for endobronchial valve eligibility, diagnosis of emphysema, BMI less than 35, <clears throat> stable less than 20 milligrams of prednisone, non-smoking, um, six minute walk between 100 and 500 meters to avoid let too ill from uh, too well patients to undergo a procedure, although less invasive has some risk. <clears throat> and then these are your target, FEV1 and residual volume based on our uh, clinical trial and total lung capacity data for Liberate, as well as data from the IMPACT trial for homogeneous patients. Arterial blood gas is shown here, and then imaging and echocardiogram to rule out patients with significant congestive heart failure or significant pulmonary hypertension. And if it's found that the um, estimated systolic pulmonary artery pressure greater than 45, 
you might decide to go on to right heart catheterization to determine eligibility. So this is a suggested sort of patient algorithm for flow to use less invasive procedures to make sure that you are getting the right patient into the queue. Medical history, lung function studies, uh, old uh, clinical CT scan, then move that patient to a CT scan of good quality if they need to be, or if it is good quality to begin with, to get a quantitative CT report by getting a stratic report to hone in, da down into the emphysematous destruction score, lobe or volume, fissure completeness. So you can see if you have a target or more than one target, then you look at the other kind of features of an inclusion exclusion criteria. If the patient goes towards a procedure, then you set up doing your chartist procedure to confirm the lobe that has no collateral ventilation, place your endobronchial valves for complete low bar occlusion, and then have you know, a post a procedural management process for keeping the patients at least three nights following the, the procedure for observation to look for pneumothorax. And this is all done in the context of a multidisciplinary program where you have people that can provide rehab, PFTs, exercise, treat the patient within the bronchial valve, follow and manage them to get a comprehensive approach for patient improved outcome. So in summary, <laughs> these are patients with severe emphysema and hyperinflated. They're looking for additional therapies outside of optimized medical treatment, which has failed to totally reach their treatment goal. Uh, the Zephyr valves have been extensively studied in four randomized controlled trials in both people with heterogeneous and homogeneous disease. The patients treated with Zephyr have reproducibly shown in broad treatment groups um, in multicenter trials, significant improvements in lung function, exercise capacity, and quality of life. And the endobronchial valve treatment has an established therapy for patients with emphysema that has been um, adopted by uh, most guidelines for patients with COPD and emphysema, emphysema treatment. So with the end of that, I'm going to stop the share and open this to any questions that the audience may have. One of the questions that was just asked, I'll take Dennis, is should the valves be deployed under general anesthesia to monitor for the five cycles of breath? Um, uh, really at the end of the, the, uh, the procedure overall, we do a leak test with saline to look for the valve placement and make sure that we don't see any air that's emanating around the outside of the valves and look for valve seating. That's usually done over a couple cycles of breaths. So I think we are, are pretty much doing that. Um, and under screening and treatment process is a step for chart is absolutely mandatory. Uh, no, it's suggested for all patients. It's mandatory when patients have fissure integrity by QCT or, or by qualitative inspection on, on the independent review between 80 to 95%. I per personally do that in all patients because I want to know uh, if the fissure is, it looks intact and there's no collateral ventilation. If the patient doesn't get a treatment response, then it's because I have an errant valve placement or, um, or that basically uh, the patient may have pleural adhesions that I can't see radiographically that's surrounding the lobe. And in 7% of the patients that are our institution that have an intact fissure that are CV negative, that don't get a treatment response, it's been due to having pleural adhesions at the time of lung bone reduction surgery that um, is, the, is the reason for that. So let's try to plan ahead to make sure that we have that. Not absolutely necessary, but suggested. Um, Jerry, I have a question. Um, I've seen with some consistency after surgical volume reduction, or even after maximal bronchodilatation, there's a small subset of patients that despite reasonable lung deflation and a good RV reduction, they still remain breathless. And I always wonder, and my own feeling about this is that they have very significant uh, dead space and VQ really problems still. They're, they've had uh, vascular destruction in the emphysema process, opening up a big dead space, uh, compromising CO2 uh, clearance, and that's, of course, sensed by the receptors and drive goes way up. And even if you improve mechanics, you're still not dealing with this central problem of a high drive. 
Um, first of all, do you, are there patients where you see a nice RV reduction of more than a half a litre, but you don't gain uh, in terms of improved breathlessness? Yeah, that's a good question, Dennis. And I think one of the things we didn't talk about, because the time is short, that for patients with homogeneous disease, it's important to do a perfusion scan to make sure that in patients with diffuse disease like that, that you're basically um, treating the lobe with at least 20% hypoperfusion compared to other lobes. So that basically you are trying to choose an area of the highest dead space so you don't compromise gas exchange. So remember that these patients don't have a monolithic sort of problem just with hyperinflation. They also have emphysematous destruction that's affecting the vascular bed that could lead to them rising their respiratory rate if you make them more hypoxemic or hypercapnic post-procedure. Um, so some of that could be due to not treating the lung area that's most diseased, that's participating still to some degree in gas exchange, gas exchange and could worsen them. The other thing is that some patients may have still impairments of pulmonary vascular bed or might have coexistent pulmonary hypertension. So you can't overstate the importance of characterizing the patient population carefully to make sure that you're choosing the patient that hyperinflation is the key to their, um, to their uh, worsened outcome. So we do nuclear medicine spec CT at our institution in all patients, whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous disease, for just the reasons that you said, Dennis, to try to choose that portion of, of their lungs to treat that is the most damage to them and most negatively causing their impairment, both from gas exchange as well as hyperinflation. I, I wanna ask you a question too, Dennis. In terms of, you speculated about what benefits lung reduction might have on cardiovascular importance. Maybe for the group, you could just, from a physiologic standpoint, expand on that and tell what possible benefits it could have. Yeah. Well, it, it can, certainly there's plenty of information or accumulating information from, mainly from MRI studies, um, looking at the impact of deflation on cardiac performance. There's also more recently, we're seeing the studies on gadolinium, um, MRI looking at blood flow and uh, the, the German group, for example, uh, Tom, Tom, Tom Wilty. Um, you see a very nice, for just the very, the sheer effect of decompression. So there's regional hyperinflation that you've now decompressed with the valve. And that uh, is, you release mechanical compression of the adjacent vasculature, improving flows. But also by reducing hyperinflation, of course, you reduce the elastic loads on the muscles of breathing. So the drive to breathe goes down because it doesn't have to, you don't need such electrical activation to get a given force generation. And you change the whole intrathoracic pressure swings within the, uh, the thorax so that the um, transmural pressure gradient across the left ventricle is favorably altered, which improves cardiac output. So there's there the recruitment of the pulmonary vasculature, number one. Um, the release of vasoconstriction in areas because of local alveolar hypoxemia, and three, the improvement in cardiac output because you've manipulated the transmural pressure gradients. And all of these have been shown. Good, it's a great answer. Um, another question is, um, I guess, the role of physical therapy post a procedure like this. What do you think the benefits would be? You know, the patient's deflated, but is this a, a time where the patient could get further improvements in whole body exercise training and even get more substantial change if we were more aggressive with physical therapy post-procedure like this? Absolutely. Our main challenge in, in trying to achieve physiological training effects in with exercise training of course, is to deal with overwhelming breathlessness. In other words, no matter how motivated the patient is, they just hit that barrier um, where it gets very uncomfortable and leads to distress and panic, et cetera. 
with a procedure that successfully reduces lung volume, you delay the onset. You, they can exercise longer before they reach that critical threshold where they have to stop. So this is a key. That means they're longer on the treadmill, longer on the bicycle before stopping. So much better chance of, of training the peripheral muscles because it's, it, that's, it's always been limited by breathlessness way before physiological maxima even are achieved. So delaying that critical, just allowing them to exercise longer is a big deal. We try it with oxygen, but I think the solution of um, valvular reduction, successful valvular reduction is even more permanent and a, a very powerful adjunct to exercise training. Is, that's probably incorporated into your plans. Is that right? After optimizing mechanics, your next step is to give them an opportunity to, to exercise. Absolutely. I mean, it's, there's a lot of pre-procedural emphasis placed on rehab, but to maximize the patient's goal, when you give them an advantage that they can basically exercise to a higher degree of training, you'll see even greater improvements. So yes. we really try to focus that. I'm going to take this, uh, paraphrase this next question from the, Dr. Lowe to, to both of us. So ha, do you experience cases where a patient felt better in two to three months post BLVR, symptoms PFDs, then they start to decline both clinically and PFT after six months post BLVR? Bronx showed valves still well seated. What would you suggest as next steps? So I'm going to start to answer this, and I'm going to have you pitch in, Dennis. So what I've seen in those cases, if the patient still has volume reduction in that lobe, and it gets back to when um, Dennis reviewed the um, gold grade and the degree of hyperinflation, that patients really are going to have a mixture of airways, disease, and emphysema. Now, we're choosing a predominant subtype in one area of the lung to treat, but that doesn't mean that these patients don't also have significant concomitant airways disease that you might not be able just to measure by looking structurally at the airway on CT scan. So I would look for airflow obstruction contributing to the patient's worsened outcome uh, in a brief period of time like this, two to three months. So Dennis, maybe you could comment on this mixture of emphysema and airways disease, both contributing to the degree of air trapping that these patients experience and worsened physiology. Absolutely. Yeah, the mechanisms in emphysema are easy because they pertain mostly to the reduced recoil pressure of the lung and the reduced driving pressure for expiratory flow. But remember, even in patients with chronic bronchitis, um, if they exercise, they're going to get air trapping or dynamic hyperinflation because of small airway uh, increased resistance. Um, and just the sheer act of increasing ventilation by either increasing tidal volume or increasing breathing frequency or both, it just means you, the mechanical time constant of the system is so delayed that um, any increase in frequency or ventilatory requirement can cause hyperinflation, totally independent of emphysema. So I agree um, that we have to tackle, in some cases, the airway inflammation that's contributing to reduced airways resistance. Um, I'm noticing more and more and more advanced disease at the impact of mucus hypersecretion, mm. which is a real problem. And I've got the idea, and, and there's some proof or evidence to support it, that if you don't clear uh, secretions in these people, the bronchodilators get nowhere near the receptors. So we're not as vigilant about this subset of patients who have a miserable existence, who are always congested and trying to clear and of course, this can happen in, very heterogeneously in conjunction with emphysema destruction, and it, it has not been touched by surgery. So that's an independent thing that you have to identify and pursue. Yeah. Yeah. I just to pick up on that. There's another question: Any contraindications for technical coughing, coughing machine, high frequency oral oscill oscill oscillation, or flutter valve? Well, in patients post procedure. If a patient has really significant mucus hypersecretion, I wouldn't recommend putting any foreign body in their airway to you. you can either treat that in some fashion medically satisfactory before you would put that in. You probably aren't gonna have a good outcome. You could take a situation and make it worse, not better. But in terms of using high flow BiPAP, CPAP that you might need to treat patients or in a patient that may need um, some technical coughing, it's not a contraindication to do that in our experience. Um, 
Let's see. We have unfortunately hit the time limit for our webinar. <laughs> We're out of here. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Dennis, thanks for a great talk. It was a pleasure working with you. Same here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Cheers.